Hello and welcome to Hexed Encounter on the Legend Sport Channel. I'm Joe. Today we're going to be playing D-Day at Tarawa from Decision Games, designed by John Butterfield. Uh, this is actually the second in a series of D-Day at games. The first being uh, D-Day at Omaha Beach, followed by this game, then D-Day at Peleliu, D-Day at Iwo Jima, and D-Day at Saipan, which will be released later this year. So there are plenty of videos out there on this game, and I'm not going to uh, overburden you with a whole lot of extra detail. Uh, there are some good uh, reviews and, um, you know, examples of play and so forth. So I'm just going to kind of go through a, go through a turn here, and we'll, we'll take it from there and see how far we get, um, depending on, you know, uh, viewership and so on. And if I can avoid a catastrophic loss, which is a very real possibility, these games are difficult to win. And um, you'll see why here. If you're unfamiliar with, with the game, I'll talk about the mechanics a little bit. But like I said, this isn't really a how to play or a review per se. This is more like an AAR uh, where I'm just going to play the game and you can watch and, and see how things go. So first thing is when we set up, okay. So set up, we have um, all of our LVTs, landing vehicle tracked. Uh, at the bottom of the of the board, which is actually the northern end, okay. So we're we're if you're looking at the bottom of the board, that's the north, and the top of the board obviously would then be the south, and the right is is west, and the left is east. So just to kind of orient yourself when I talk about uh, compass directions, that would be the uh, the layout here. So at the very uh, bottom there, we have our LVTs. There are nine of them. Uh, you can see we have on top one A. Okay, uh, two A, one A, one B, one C. That's Red Beach one. Okay, so underneath here we would have uh, that's Company I, Third Battalion, Second Marines. And then under here we have a Hero unit, and I'll talk about that when we uh, when we get a little further in. And then under there we have Co Company K, Third Battalion, Second Marines. And you'll see on the on the counter, on the right side there's a one and an R one. So that indicates first turn and red beach one, okay? So if we, if we move the units, you can see there on the board, there's R1B. That's the B um, starting point for red beach one. Okay, so this is red beach one, red beach two, red beach, red beach three. And you can see the LVTs have three for red beach three, two for red beach two, and one for red beach one. So the, uh, the landing process is, is really quite simple and it involves uh, drawing cards and then, you know, follow, basically following what, what's written on the card. So very simple, straightforward mechanic. So we draw a card. Okay. And the first thing we do is uh, we look at the, the top line there where it says LVT and then there are two sections, no drift and then um, a U and an L and a location on the board. So no drift means that the, the unit did not drift, the LVT did not drift to one side or the other. The U would indicate how many steps of units are uh, survive the landing, and the L indicates how many LVT points for that specific LVT. LVT steps survive the, the landing, and the location is the beach, so this one makes the beach. Uh, but you only use the first one you basically use two cards for each LVT. So this is the first card, which is only used for drift. So this one has no drift, okay? And we always start on the far right, okay? So we're looking at uh, LVT 1A, which is carrying Company I of the 3rd Battalion of the 2nd Marine Regiment. Now we flip our next card here, and this indicates that all four steps of that unit and both steps of the LVT actually survive the landing. So this is a good card. This is a good result. So we discard here. We have a line of uh, phases. And then our turn track over here. Uh, we have a lost box for the Marines, an LVT recovery area, and then Japanese-specific things up here. Uh, depth markers. I'll talk about that in a bit. Admiral Shib Shibasaki, Shibasaki rather the uh, commander of the Japanese forces. He can be killed, which will have impacts on potential events in the game. Okay, so we, we know that we got uh, unit 
all four steps of our infantry company and both steps of the LVT survived the landing. So the Red Beach 1 is going this way, straight up. These two beaches are angled. Red 2 and Red 3 are angled in this direction. So we're going to go like this in a zigzag pattern and get to the beach, which is here. And then we remove our LVT and put that guy back in the LVT box. He'll be used again in our next turn. Okay, so Company I has hit the beach. So now we flip our next card. So again, we get no drift. And then we flip a second card. And we get three steps of the unit and two steps of the LVT survive. But it also says water for the location. So when you get a water location, you end up in one of the boxes here. And you'll see as I do this. Okay, and this is the unit that's carrying, or the LVT that's carrying Major Ryan and Company K. So again, we go in a zigzag pattern. And we get to here. And um, we know that the company lost a step, so we flip it over. Four steps and three steps are on this initial counter. And then there are replacement counters for uh, two steps and one step infantry units. Uh, Major Ryan does not take a loss. Um, leaders and HQs don't take losses on the landing. And I'll recover my LVT back to the LVT box. And so we just repeat the process. Third one, drift PR. Okay, so that means pivot right. But there's no, um, on Red Beach 2, you'll see there's a pivot right on the, on the hex. There isn't one in Red Beach 1, so that's, it gets ignored on Red Beach 1. Um, so that one's done and then we take our survival one. Now this one says, uh, all four units, both LVT survive inland two. Okay. So that means we're going to actually make a little progress off the beach and go inland, uh, two hexes or this. So again, we go zigzag. And then two hexes inland. And these are our engineer engineer units. So that's uh, one, two. So they're actually here behind the Japanese unit. Okay, now we move to Red Beach 2 and we just continue the process. Drift 1R. So we slide them to, to the right by one hex. Then we have uh, unit four units and both LVT survive again. We're, we're pulling really good cards here. We're going to get to the beach. So now these these go in a straight line because we're on a diagonal. And they get to the beach right here. Okay. And I moved the wrong unit. Hang on. <laughs> wrong one. That's red. That's R2B. Uh, R2A is here. I moved the wrong unit. Sorry. So we're going to go here. Okay. So company F... 2nd Battalion of 2nd Marine Regiment has landed there. Um, and we're in good shape here. We're doing, we're doing pretty well as landings go. Okay, we have no drift for B, our Red Beach 2B. And we have 3 and 1. So we're going to lose a step, of infant, a step of the unit and a step of the LVT, but we're also going inland 2 again. Okay, so that's this guy here. So we're going to lose one unit of our LVT, and I'll just move it to the side. And we're going to lose one unit of our engineers. We have four units of four steps rather of engineers. We lose one step, and we're going to go here, and then two inland would be here. Okay. All right. So final unit for Red Beach Two, which is Company E, Second Battalion, Second Marines, no drift. And this card would have been catastrophic. We would have lost both the LVT and the unit completely with this result. So luckily for us, that's just a drift result. And we get as good a result as we can. So there you have your two extremes. You have the total loss and the total survival of your unit. And this one, just everybody gets to the beach um, with no losses. So, and there we go. All right. Now we move to Red Beach 3, 
no drift. And we lose one step on the unit and one step on the LVT and get to the beach. So Company F, 2nd Battalion, 8th Marines, loses a step. So they were three-step, and our LVT also lost a unit, and they get here. Okay, that's a one-step LVT now. Now, um, you see this line here? This is actually um, seawall. So the seawall here, because we have our terrain chart right here. Okay, so that's a seawall. Um, so let's, let's continue with our landing on Red Beach 3. Okay, so we have Drift 1R on this card. So these guys are going to slide one hex to the right. These are engineers, two engineering uh, units here, engineer units rather. And we get a 4. So all the units, none of the units lose a step. We lose a step on the LVT and we get to the beach. So each LVT step can carry two steps of unit, um, of engineer or infantry. And we get to the beach. As I said, everybody got, got there, but the LVT takes one step loss. Um, so final, final one for the landing, drift 1R again. So we slide one, one hex to the right. And four and two all survive, and we go inland one, okay? Um, this is going to be interesting because we're going to be really close to that Japanese unit. Um, so we're going to go in here and then over the seawall and up here, one hex. So they're sitting between two Japanese units, one of which has a depth marker, which it should not. Um, you don't start with depth markers. I'm not sure how that got in there. All right. Um... So that's it. That's the end of the amphibious phase. All right, I'm just going to straighten out this, these discards here. So this phase is now done, and we move to phase two, which is the event phase. Now in turn one, the only thing that happens on the uh, event phase is you do not draw a card, which we normally would. On turn one, you put depth, uh, two depth markers for the Japanese. And what the depth marker is is just kind of a, like a force multiplier. It just kind of gives the Japanese unit um, some additional strength. Um, essentially and so we get two and the way you deploy those depends on um, you know what they're facing basically so we have some units here that have an American unit right next to them so they'll be the ones that will get the coastal coastal depth you also have inland depth so some of these are inland positions and then these along the beach obviously are coastal positions so coastal depth would apply to our coastal units and inland depth would apply to our inland uh, areas and you can see if you move uh, if you move the the unit this has an eye that's an inland hex um, it's also a potential tank location but the tanks were drawn for these three locations so um, we draw we draw two um, they're all face down so you don't know what they are specifically so I'm going to give one to this this unit here and I'm going to give one to uh, this unit here since they both have uh, full strength marine companies sitting right next to them. As does this one as well. And this one, um, it's the same unit. So uh, that would complete the event phase and we move to the Japanese fire phase. All right, so Japanese fire phase, we draw a card. Okay, early game, especially turn one, you're looking at um, these boxes and the, and the shape. All right, so our boxes, we have uh, yellow, red, and green, and then a triangle. So the positions are color-coded. So any yellow position, any red position, any green position will be able to fire this turn. Um, and then you have types of, of fire dots. So a solid fire dot would be intense fire. So, you know, that's generally close and strong fire, and then the ones that have more of a, like, um, checkered appearance are what's called uh, steady fire, which is, which is less intense, but still can, uh, can take a, take a, take a uh, step out of a unit. 
and then there's um, the water as well. There's fields of fire in the water. This this yellow line here indicates the field the the basically the field of fire for that yellow hex right there D4, and then it also abuts up against the pier here um, because the pier is basically a hex. It's like a impassable hex side. So the, all of this water right here, you can see all these yellow dots. That would be within the yellow group's field of fire. So any units that were actually out in the water here would be eligible to be hit by that unit right there in the yellow box, uh, as well as any units that have a yellow dot, whether it's a solid dot or a uh, checkered dot. Now, you start with priority. So the priority one would be the, the solid dot. So any American unit that's in a, a hex that has a solid yellow dot, like this one, ha does not have a solid dot because of the seawall. It's got a checkered dot. Um, and that one does not have solid either. So it looks like the only, like they can fire, this unit can fire at, at this one. Shoot, man. It can fire at this guy or this guy. Okay. Or, or it could anybody in the water because the, the solid dots are in this kind of arc around it here. Um, and it's attached to the hex side. So since this hex side is attached to this hex, that indicates this is, it is also attached to this hex, but it indicates that this would be a, a, an intense fire for these two yellow positions right here. And then uh, this is also one for this guy as well as the green one. Okay, so we do have yellow and green and um, red. We have red as well. So uh, it's going to be an interesting, uh, interesting turn here for the Americans. Okay, so the way we resolve this so we have our Japanese fire chart here, okay? So as you can see, fire level in U.S. occupied hex, intense fire, solid, steady fire, um, checked, checkerboard, I guess is kind of what, it's, what it looks like. And then machine gun fire would be priority three. So that's any hex that's adjacent to a solid hex when the fire type is M, okay? Um, and then a water hex. Okay, so the water hex, obviously they, uh, all of these project their fire out into the, the lagoon. Then you want to check is the, is the Japanese position revealed or unrevealed? Okay, or uh, unoccupied, that, that we'll talk about later, that doesn't come into effect at, at the very beginning of the game. All right, um, and then you have the possibility of having concentrated targets if you have more than four, ha four uh, steps in the uh, in the target area and then you have possibilities for armor bonus leader hits and machine guns that's mentioned up here so um it says hit limits in turns one through ten fire from a japanese position or position group may hit a number of u.s units up to the number of japanese units and depth markers present all right so we have one unit it's unrevealed okay it's going to shoot at this guy right here our three-step um Company e, uh, F of the 2nd Battalion, 8th Marines. All right, so it's unrevealed and it's a, a steady fire because they don't have any, any intense fire possible targets here. So they're going to shoot at this guy. And um, what it says is <clears throat> for an unrevealed, non-armored U.S. units with the target symbol. So you have to look at the target symbol. And our target symbol is actually a triangle. So actually, I'm wrong. They're not going to fire at this one. They're going to fire at this one because this one has the triangle symbol on it. So our triangle symbol indicates that this is the unit that's going to be receiving the fire. It has the checkerboard um, symbol there. So it's going to lose a step and be disrupted. All right. So it gets a disrupted marker as well. Okay, so that guy has, now that's the fire action for this one. They get one hit basically because it's one unit. So now we can go to the, um, we look for other yellow and I don't think they're, well, we do have a yellow here. We have one here. 
okay? And we have targets in the water. We also have one here on land. So um, the, the priority is pretty much um, going to indicate that it needs to hit this one that's actually on the beach because this is priority two. It has the checkerboard yellow circle. So this guy here, it's unrevealed. Does it have the symbol? No, okay? So then it goes into the water hexes. And this one actually does have the triangle. So this guy is going to take a hit. And because he already took one coming in, he's going to actually take, um, this unit's actually going to be reduced. So this is, uh, this is Company K, 3rd Battalion, 2nd Marines. So I'm going to find my, my K32. Okay, here's my K32 reduced. I'm going to put my full strength one in the loss box. And I'm going to put this guy underneath Major Ryan here. And so that takes care of that unit's attack. Um, that completes the yellow. So we're going to look for red. And here's a red here. Okay. And we have, again, a the seawall is here. So it's a checkered circle. So that has a circle symbol. Can't be, can't be hit. There are no units in this red water area which is really wide. That's a wide field of fire here, and it doesn't... Luckily for the Americans, there are no units in there. So we move on from red. I don't... Oh, we have red here as well. So this guy, okay, again, that's a checkerboard one. So we're looking for the triangle, which it does not have. So that one cannot fire there either. And again, we don't have anybody in the area for the um in the water for red to hit so we avoid damage here as well um, that's actually brown and then we have blue here so we're looking for green now and we have a green here and we have a green over here as well so the green here okay so this one has a depth marker as well not that that particularly matters in this instance, but it would matter later on for other things. So, well, it does matter because we can have up to two hits, I believe. So, um, it won't matter ultimately because I don't think it can, uh, can't fire on this unit. And this is the only unit in its field of fire. So this guy is, um, again, a checkered board, checkerboard circle. So it's not going to actually take a hit because it does not have the uh, triangle, it's got the diamond. So that, that's, that one is saved as well. Now we come over here to this green, okay? And this green is one, one step, it's just one unit with no depth. We have two engineer units here, and there's no fire dot in this hex. And there is a building there. So um, I'm assuming that means the engineers are holed up in this building and the Japanese can't attack them. So that would end our Japanese fire phase. And at the end of the phase, what we do, we would do an, uh, an artillery fire check as well. Artillery fire does not happen on turn one. Otherwise, we would use this, uh, this nine, any, if we had an, an occupied artillery location, which we do, um, they would be able to fire at any of the American units. So, um, but that does not happen on turn one. So again, we, we avoid some, some damage there. So then we go to the disruption removal, which just means removing our disruption from our three tank units. So now we have our revealed tank units. The, uh, the tank units start revealed and disrupted. They also have a depth marker underneath them, which is unrevealed. And that ends the Japanese uh, phase. Now, the next phase would typically be another event card if we're beyond turn 10, which obviously we're not. Same thing with the engineer and HQ phase, only after uh, turn 10. So we go to our US action phase, okay? So now we can do actions with our units. So if a unit has a, um, has a, has a leader or a hero, they get what's called a free action, which allows them to do something based on, um, you know, having a leader. 
So in this case, we do have one, we do have a, a leader on the board in Major Ryan. And so these guys can actually move because they have uh they have a leader. Otherwise, we would have to expend one of our three moves to to move the any of these units. And we will if we move anybody else, and we will do other actions, but um, I'm going to actually take this and move um, move this unit with with Major Ryan and bring them onto the beach because you can go two hexes. So I'm going to uh, actually put them here on the beach. And then you can use this US action taken to show that they're not allowed to do another action because even though it's a free action, it just means it doesn't count towards our limit of three actions. It doesn't mean that it like you can do another action you get one one action per per unit basically okay so that indicates to me now that i remember that they actually did something and i'm not going to do anything else with them now the other thing i can do if i now i need to figure out what i want to do with the rest of these guys right so we have we have engine we have several units that are basically in contact with the enemy they're adjacent to an enemy um since I drew so well coming in for the landing, I'm thinking I'm going to actually be pretty aggressive on this turn. Um, you can get a catastrophic loss when you don't have at least one three-step unit on the on the beach. I have um, many that have three. I mean, this is a four, that's a four, that's a four, that's a four, this one's a three. Um, we're in good shape as far as the, um, that one's a two, I know, but um, we're in good shape in that in that regard. So what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try to hit some of these Japanese units um, with close combat and try and knock them out. So we're going to do a move action here. That's going to trigger a close combat. I'm going to do one here as well. These guys both have depth as well. Okay, so I'm targeting them first. Um, the depth gives them a little extra power. So I want to make sure I try to get rid of them as quickly as possible. So that's two and I have one left. So we have uh, we have this area here. We have this area here. Um, we have this one. I actually wouldn't be able to get to a close, um, close combat with this tank because the rule is when you move into a hex that has an intense field of fire for an enemy unit, which would be this red dot for this guy right here, that would halt your move. You wouldn't be able to move any further. So I would not be able to just come in and, and attack this tank, although I would really love to. So instead, I can either assault this guy with close combat or this guy. Um, this is a dual position. So I think I'm going to actually hit the blue when you draw a fire card and it has two symbols on it like this guy does here. This one has two, um, two boxes together on, on the brown. That indicates that you would have to have either a unit with a depth marker or one of these fire positions that are joined together. So if I attack this guy and knock him out, then um, that would break this connection. So I'm gonna do that as well. And I should be using my tweezers, but I'm being uh, lazy today for some reason. Okay, so. We're done with our moves. We have our three moves. We had our free move. Um, I'm just gonna remove this because I'm done with my actual actions here. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to resolve my, my close combat and I'm gonna start over here. So um, the way close combat works is you draw cards for each side. The US will get one card for each step of unit, so this is a four step unit. We're gonna draw four cards. Um, and then there are ways to get additional cards as well. Um, so here's our close combat procedure. And so uh, you get a card if you have a flamethrower and another card if you have a hero. For the Japanese, you get one card for each depth marker and unit. So that would get two for that. And then you get additional ones for if it's an attacking unit, which it's not. If its strength is greater than four, we don't know that yet. Uh, we don't know if it has the close combat requirement. And it's not a tank. We know it's not a tank and it's not a night turn. So um, what we'll do is reveal, reveal this and see what it is. 
So we're going to reveal our unit. It does have close combat right there in the in the corner. It has close combat. And close coastal depth also has close combat. <laughs> so this is actually going to be a four on four. Um, actually, no, the Japanese are going to actually have an advantage. They're going to have five cards because they have a total of four power here. This is actually a really good unit, apparently. And um, <clears throat> the Americans all will have four. So this is going to be four on five. Four for the Americans and five for the uh, for the Japanese, and this means that, that the assault probably will not work. <clears throat> so I'm going to alternate here. Okay, so here's our Japanese deck. We're going to flip the first one, and we look for. Um, the event first, it says CC. When it says CC, that's a close combat event. And it says conscripts surrender. So we're gonna discard that here and we're gonna look again at our units. For our conscript surrender, it's right here in our close combat events. If the Japanese unit's not a headquarters and is in the 111P or 4FC formation, the unit and the depth marker are eliminated and the combat's over. This is actually from the third SBD. So this is actually one of the Japanese Marine units, I believe, and they are not going to surrender. Okay, so essentially um, that card has no effect. And now we flip our American card, uh, CC US withdrawal hit. I'm not withdrawing, I'm, go I'm going for it. I'm gonna take my chances. Um, so that's a no effect as well. Our next Japanese card has no uh, close combat event. So then we look for the color, which we do have, which is blue. So that means the U.S. is going to lose a step. So um, here's our U.S. unit, and it's going to lose a step. So it's now a three-step. We take our next U.S. card. Nothing, no color, no event, no effect. Japanese card, they get a green again. Okay, they also have a U.S. withdrawal hit, which I'm not, I'm not doing. All right, um, so now this becomes a two-step unit. Um, E28. Okay, so there's E28. This goes in the in that box there. Okay, so we move on. Uh, U.S. card, CC Heroism. All right, so let's look at our Heroism on the sheet here. Heroism, add a card to the card pile of the side revealing this card and remove a card from the card pile of the other side. So the U.S. is getting an additional card and the Japanese are losing a card. So we're going to take another card for the U.S. and we're going to discard the Japanese card, one Japanese card. And now it is the Japanese turn again. And again, they get a withdrawal hit and they also get <laughs> another green. So... Um, this gets reduced again, and now it's down to one step. But the Japanese are out of cards. The Americans have uh, two left. So, um, again, nothing from the Americans. And the final card, and again, nothing from the Americans. So that was a dismal failure, although we did not get wiped out. So our, units go, our unit goes back to where it started. It gets a disruption marker. And the Japanese unit also gets a disrupted marker. Okay, so hopefully our next one will be better than that one was. So here we have uh, another coastal unit. This is a 111P. So this unit, if we get the conscript surrender, this unit would surrender. Okay, they have a flamethrower requirement, which doesn't come into effect on this, and they get a tactical reinforcement is their depth. Okay, so same thing. They have, uh, they're not going to be a four, so they won't get a bonus card there. They'll get two, one for the depth and one for the unit. The U.S. gets four. So we'll do the same thing we just did where the Japanese get one. Okay, so here's our Japanese, um, deck and our American deck. I'm going to move them off so they're not on the board. 
Um, I was actually supposed to line up my second wave, and I didn't do that, but I'll do it at the end of the turn here. So um, this is a good card for the Japanese reinforce. So on a reinforce, they get it. They get an additional card, and they would also get a depth marker if they didn't have one. But since they do, they don't get that. So they just get an additional card, which is still a benefit to them. First American card, um, and this this position group is green, but there's no green and there's no event. So we flip the next Japanese. No green, no event. American, we have a green, but no event. This time, so the Japanese will lose their depth marker. I'm going to just put that out, okay? And I'll keep drawing from here when I need new depth markers. So um, we, we flip our Japanese, and we get <laughs> another reinforce. So they get another card, and they get another depth marker. Okay. US card. We 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 knock the depth <laughs> depth marker out again. If we could just keep them from getting another reinforce, we'd be okay and maybe be able to actually win this. Okay, so they get nothing here. There's no event, no green. Last chance Americans, if this has a green on it, they're going to win this close combat and they do. Okay. So this guy gets knocked out. Because it's a conscript level, it does not go in the eliminated unit box where it can be re um, redrawn. Um, I guess it, I'm gonna put it there. I think it does go in there, but it can't be redrawn, which would go in the reserve units, I believe. So uh, that actually ends, oh wait, we got one more. We got this guy right here. So this one is three American steps and the Japanese only get one. And this is another tough unit with the close combat. So they're gonna get two cards and the Americans are gonna get three. All right, so, all right. Okay, Japanese always go first. All right, our color here is blue. We have a blue. So the Americans are gonna lose a step. So I'm gonna eliminate this engineer unit. And now we're we're pretty much even odds here, although the Americans have three cards and the Japanese only have one. Okay, so it's blue and we do have a have a blue. So that's going to eliminate this Japanese unit. And this engineer is going to take this position and get a disrupted marker. Okay, so now we will discard our additional drawn cards because the close combat's over. We're going to move to the end of this phase. Um, I'm probably going to reshuffle only because at this point we have some units that will be landing, and I'll set those up right now since we're going to be moving to turn two. Um, and I'm going to put this back down here. All right, so... When we put our units out for, um, you know, for the landing phase, the amphibious operations phase, again, they have an indicator of what beach they go on. So uh, this one goes on red one, second turn. I already organized these when I was doing setup. So um, the red, red one, oh, that's red two. This one's red two. This one's red three. And this one's red three. Okay, so they're all four. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. We need 12 total steps of LVTs to carry these guys. All right, um, I'll hold off the ones for now. I have three ones at least, I know. So we have a two step LVT for, for red beach two. We'll put that here. We have a one step. Um, we have another two step for red beach two. We have a red beach one, two step, another red beach one, two step. And then um, for red beach three, we'll just part, we'll just pair these up. Um, so we'll take two for that and two for this, and we can, uh, nobody has to wade, at least initially here. 
for when we start our next turn. So I'm actually going to wrap up the video now. That was turn one. Um, probably a little longer than I hoped it would be, but I did want to explain some of the mechanics as we played. I'm going to uh, do another video for turn two so you can see the rest of it and how, the, how it all works and everything. So if you've enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, um, spread the word, etc. cetera. Uh, help me grow my channel here. And uh, I'll be back, you know, soon, probably in probably tomorrow. There'll be, you know, the, the turn two video. Um, and we'll see how far we get with this before I either take a catastrophic loss or somehow actually win the game, which is, again, difficult to do. So thank you for watching. I'm Joe, and this has been Hexed Encountered on the Legend Sport Channel.